Hello and welcome to this short introductory video series about machine learning. My name is Boyan and the main goal of my work is to empower more people to take advantage of machine learning by making it more easy to use. In this video series, we try to cover the most important concepts and show how they fit together without going too much into details. If you're a beginner trying to make sense of the field of machine learning, we believe these videos could help you get started. Here's an outline of the topics we'll cover in this video series. Each topic is formulated as one particular question related to the field. In this video, we will focus on question number four. To recap the things we covered in the previous video, we mentioned that machine learning is concerned with constructing a predictor, which takes input data, for example, images of handwritten digits, and produces output data, which we call predictions. An essential piece of information the predictor needs to function are its parameters or weights. In supervised learning, our training data comes with a set of correct labels, which we can compare to the model predictions and see how good it is at performing its task. For this, we use the objective, which for example can give us an accuracy score. The general problem is to find a predictor that will give us the best accuracy score, while the only thing we can change are the parameters. In machine learning, our approach is to try to learn those parameters from training data. Hence, the predictor acts as a parameterized function, which we call the model, where the parameters have the ability to control the behavior of this model. On the other hand, the objective function is used to measure the quality of this model. This might seem pretty abstract at this point. For that reason, in this video, we'll try to dig a bit deeper into machine learning models. We will see what a model is, what kinds of models are out there, and how are they differentiated among themselves? A machine learning model is probably the central element of study in machine learning. A lot of effort goes into developing models that are better at performing certain tasks. There are several ways we can go about defining what a machine learning model is. We can say that it is a function that makes predictions based on some parameters, and this function has a corresponding algorithm used to optimize those parameters. Knowing that parameters can determine the behavior of functions, we can say that for each specific set of parameter values, we actually have a different function. A model is then a family of functions, all sharing the same set of parameters. And the algorithm is there to select the best function from that family. Another view might be that a model is a mathematical structure that embodies a set of statistical assumptions about the way its data is generated. Behind each of these views is a large field of study, which we tried to compress into a simple definition, mainly to show that there are different ways in which experts look at models. However, for the sake of our introduction to the field, we can take the view most natural to beginners, the outside view. Namely, let's view the model as a black box and try to get a feeling for what it is in terms of how we interact with it. Put simply, a model is something that can be trained with training data. This training process produces what we refer to as a trained model, which in the previous video we called the predictor. The trained model can take new data it has never seen before and produce predictions. Let's go over some examples of machine learning models. One of the most basic models is the linear regression model. It aims at solving the regression problem by constructing a line that passes through all the data points, which is where the word linear in its name comes from. Another popular model is called decision tree. It is usually used for classification, and it goes about this by viewing the path to a solution as a series of decisions. For example, if we want to decide what animal we're looking at, we could first ask ourselves if it has feathers. And then, if the answer to that question is yes, then we decide that it must be either a hawk or a penguin. Then we ask if the animal can fly. If not, then we know it's not a hawk and must be a penguin. Of course, this is a simple example, but hopefully it demonstrates the essence of how a decision tree works. Another example of a popular model is a support vector machine. Understanding how this model works involves a bit more mathematical background. But essentially, it is a model that is often used for classification. While it is trained, its goal is to find a way to separate the space of data points based on their categories 
such that the margin between our boundary and any single data point is as large as it can be. One more very popular example of a machine learning model is an artificial neural network. The simplest kind is the so-called feed-forward neural network. We'll go into more details in a bit, but neural networks are essentially a model that is made up of simple computational units called nodes that are connected into a sort of a network structure with multiple layers. Information then flows from one side of this network to the other. It has been shown that this method can result in very powerful data transformations, which can be good at working with complex data. Apart from these four examples, there are many other types of models. In fact, each one of these four models is an example of its own model category. We have linear models, which also include models like logistic regression and ridge regression, all of which assume, in some sense, a linear relationship between the input variables and the output variable. Then we have tree-based models, which include random forest and boosted decision trees. These models are based on a process of construction of various kinds of decision trees and the use of them to compute their outputs. We have kernel-based models, which also include Gaussian processes. These models rely on a similarity function called a kernel, which can compute a similarity between two data points. The kernel is then used to project data points into a different space with the hope of being easier to work with if the data points become easier to distinguish in this new space. Among artificial neural networks, we have convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks, all of which are variations on the basic idea with their own specific structural characteristics. In the rest of this video, we will go a bit deeper into two types of models, linear regression as one of the simplest ones and neural networks as one of the most popular ones today. As its name suggests, linear regression is made to solve the regression problem. In our example, we have a data set where each data point represents an individual for whom we know the years of experience, which we take as input, and we want to compute their salary. Given this data set, which contains many examples of individuals, each defined with two variables, salary and years of experience, a linear regression approach would assume a linear relationship between these two variables. This function, y equals w times x plus b, represents our mathematical model. In this model, x is the input variable, y is the output variable, and w and b are parameters. The learning problem then becomes the search for optimal parameters w and b. A common approach to find those optimal parameters is gradient descent, mentioned in the previous video. Once we have the optimal parameters, we want to be able to predict the salary of a new individual given their years of experience. To do this, we simply plug in the years of experience into X, use the parameters W and B that we learned, and compute our predicted salary Y. Of course, the linear regression model we've just shown is very simple there are multiple ways that were found to make them more powerful. For example, even if our data doesn't follow a straight line, we still might be able to make our model work. We do this by extending the input variables into a polynomial, which is made up of multiple terms. The parameters associated with each term, for example, b0, b1, and b2 in the figure, are still linear, which means we can use the same method as before. It's just that we have increased the number of parameters. However, the benefit is that we are now able to express curvy lines, which represents a better fit to our data set. A problem with curvy lines is that if we let them be too loose, our learning algorithm might make them too curvy. This is bad because it doesn't represent a good fit for our data. To prevent this excessive curviness, we apply a smoothing operation on those lines, which we call regularization. Linear regression is very much related to logistic regression, which is also a linear method, but for solving classification problems. In general, the main thing to remember about linear models is that they are considered simpler models because they usually have relatively few parameters. On the opposite end, we have another popular type of models which have a very large number of parameters. Of course, we are talking about artificial neural networks. The main thing to remember about them is this typical structure that they have. 
They are constructed as a directed graph made up of simple computational nodes, which are organized into layers. And each node has incoming edges from the previous layer and sends its outgoing edges into the subsequent layer. Each edge is associated with a single parameter. And as we can see, the number quickly becomes very large, especially as we keep adding more layers. However, this number of parameters allows them to represent a very rich set of complex functions, which enable them to be very useful for solving many hard problems in machine learning. What we see here is the most basic form of neural network, called a feed-forward neural network. We will see two additional categories of neural networks, which are still built from simple computational nodes, but the nodes are connected to form a slightly different structure. The first such category is called convolutional neural networks. They are usually very large, so it becomes hard to visualize them as individual nodes. Therefore, we usually depict them as 2D or 3D boxes, and we assume that the nodes are organized into a mesh structure. These meshes of nodes act together and represent a sort of multi-dimensional filter. Each filter becomes sensitive to certain patterns found in the incoming layer. For example, one filter may detect a circle, another might detect an oval or a diagonal line or any kind of complex multidimensional pattern. If the pattern is not found in the input, then the filter remains silent. But if a pattern is found, it sends out a strong signal that becomes available to subsequent layers for further processing. The most common application for convolutional neural networks is image processing as they have been shown to work very well with discovering irregular patterns commonly found in nature. Another kind of neural network is called recurrent neural network. The main thing that differentiates them from regular feed-forward neural networks is their so-called self-loops. These are cyclical structures where a node can have its outgoing signal propagated back into it. This has been shown to allow neural networks to keep some sort of working memory. This working memory has proven to be very useful for handling sequential data, where each element of the sequence, for example a word in a sentence, can be processed one at a time. When applying these networks to a sequence, it becomes easier to reason about what's going on by unwinding the network. We see here that the network processes the input sequence x0, x1, and all the way to xt, and for example, when processing the element x1 to produce the output h1, it reads both the element itself, but also its memory formed by processing the previous element x0. Now that we've seen an overview of a lot of different machine learning models, we might ask ourselves, how are they all different? Specifically, what do we need to know about them in order to decide which one can be suitable for our specific problem? As a rule of thumb, we present several properties of machine learning models that are all correlated with each other, meaning the bigger the value of one property, the more likely the value of another property would also be big. If we talk about complex models, we usually express this in terms of the number of parameters. The more parameter a model has, usually it needs more data to train. Hence, if we don't have a lot of data, we might want to go for simpler models. The more parameters and or data we have, the more compute time we will need to train them. However, at the same time, the more complex models with more parameters we have, typically we will be able to learn more powerful patterns in our data. The choice of a model mostly depends on the problem at hand. However, as a general rule, it is best to always go for the simplest model which we can show to work sufficiently well on our specific problem. There is of course much more to this process of selecting models as it can be quite tricky. Therefore, we need a somewhat more complicated process, some parts of which we will cover in the next video. That's all we have for this video. We hope it managed to clarify some basic concepts. Make sure to check out our next video, where we will talk about the process that takes place when we start from a machine learning problem towards a solution. Finally, feel free to check out our website and learn about our very own effort to make it easier to use machine learning for your specific problem. You'll find all the links in the description.